just one word the darkness has to retreat just one touch I feel the presence of the Lord just one touch my eyes were open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that
to remind me of your love cause you are good and in the morning I'll see you are good and in the evening I'll see
as we continue to press through and uh, look through this second, kind of like the second part of this series where we've talked about being full and being filled, and now we're kind of moving into a different area as far as what, how that affects us and how that affects the church. Uh, probably more than anything else, over this next season of time, what we're talking about, what we're teaching about on this series of Make a Move is probably the most important thing that will impact our church for the next four or five years. It's not just enough to be filled. One of the wonderful things is, is we come in and we feel the presence of God. We come in, we experience and watch God to do incredible things, uh, miracles and watching lives change. That All that is awesome. But eventually what has to happen is what God intended for a church to ultimately accomplish. And if it doesn't, then it just becomes a, a cycle. Uh, as one person wrote it in a book, closing the back door. People come in, people will go out. They never seem to ever get established, never seem to ever get totally locked in. Well, well what's the problem, Brother Lot? Well, first off, as we talked about, we have to have a desire over this last series that we want to be continually filled. We have to have a hunger and a desire that in our lives we continually want to stay in the presence of God. Isn't it easy uh, as you kind of get all the stuff going on and your friends are around and you're watching stuff on TV and this is going, that just being in the presence of God stops being important. That, that's what the world brings into our life. That is the, the, the main thrust of everything is to take your attention, your mind, whether it's politics or, or what's going on in the weather or what's happening in life or how much gas costs or whatever it may be, he's trying desperately to get you to where you don't listen, can't hear, and can't feel God as he moves through the Spirit in your life. And some of you here this morning, I, you could tell me, and we could talk for 40 minutes about all the stuff going on in your life. We could talk about all the stuff. But if I said, well, just tell me, how's, how's it going with you and God? Well, brother Lord, I'll be honest with you, you know, I just really, what is it? It's because we, we put so much energy, so much time and all the other stuff. And then we can't figure out why when we get to church, we're like so tired, I could just go to sleep. Why? Because there's so much taken from us. And until we get this fixed in the church world, I'm not talking about the world, but in the church world, until we get this fixed, we're going to struggle with just what we call normal church or, or, or enjoying church or enjoying our spiritual lives. So we, last week we talked about the first thing that you have to do in making a move is let God's Spirit move in. You're going to have to let Him move. We talked about 1 Corinthians and, and we went through some of the spiritual gifts and different things that, that God wants to do. He doesn't want you operating out of Galatians where you're, it's the flesh, but He wants you operating through the fruits of the Spirit. And we said that as the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, all of this is operating in your life, then the manifestation gifts begin to come. The manifestation gifts are where the Holy Spirit then can empower you and use you to touch an entire church, to touch the people around you. What we do is we just want to use the fruit of the Spirit, and we wrestle in that area, and we think, well, that's all there is. That's all I want to talk I mean, if I can just love people, Brother Lot, just God give me strength to love people. Well, that's baby stuff. You ought to be way past that. If you're still praying, Lord, help me love, there's an issue. Lord, just, just, just don't let me lose my cool. That, that's an issue. You should be way past that. You should be teaching others. Others should be watching you. You should be an illustration. You should be an example by now, the writer said. Those are manifestation gifts then can come through my life. And we talked about some of those that, that uh, he mentions as the fruit of the Spirit. And we talked about a few of the manifestation gifts. And let me reiterate those. We talked about the, uh, the Spirit moving in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 7. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. But let me jump from there to where I want to go today. Part two, make a move, and here's what I want to talk about when I talk about making a move today. Look at the person beside you and tell them, it's time for you to be the gift. 
It's time for you to be the gift. Not to get a gift, not to receive a gift, but it's time for you to be the gift. Well, Brother Lot, I don't, I mean, I know we're supposed to come to church and get our blessing. We used to sing that song years ago, you know, I've come to the enemy's camp, take back what he stole from me, take back. I mean, I know all about, you know, what I'm here to do is to get my stuff. I mean, he stole my joy, my happiness. He, he stole my past. He stole, I'm here to get my stuff. I understand all that. But in maturity as a Christian, what you need to begin to focus on, once you get the fruit of the Spirit operating in your life, once you realize that God wants to manifest himself in my life, think of it as a cup that's full and it's wonderful and it's great. But what God does is he wants to fill that cup to where it flows over the saucer, the table, and he wants to touch other lives. Let me read a few scriptures. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 12 and 28. 1 Corinthians 12 and 28. I want to go through a few scriptures and just show you that throughout this New Testament, this is what was taught. It's not some new theology. Here's what it says. And God has appointed these in the what? So that means God has put inside the church these gifts. Now we think of them as the things, as the actual things that are given, but I want you to think about it that none of these gifts can enter into the church unless they come through somebody. They are not gifts that we can just, you know, turn on the PA system and say, all right, now the gifts are fixing to flow. The gifts are flowing through people. And notice how he says this, as God has appointed these to the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps of administrations, varieties of tongues. Go with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 12 and 11. And I know they're pulling this up as I'm calling them out because I didn't get them list. So, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to what? Each one individually. So you can't look at the person beside you and say, well, you know how we are. No, it's no we. There is no we in this. Every one of you sitting there, even though you're married to the person, even though you're kin to the person, they may be your mama, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, it may be your wife, your husband, none of you in this room, God is going to give the same gifts to. Individually, you cannot blame this on your spouse. You can't say, well, you're messing my life. No, they're not, they're, they're not responsible for this. This is strictly between you and the Spirit, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. Go in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 12 and 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for what purpose? To profit all. Guess who's the gift? You. When God says, I need to really help my church, He sent you. I really need to get some things done. He sent you. You are the gift to the church. Now, I know for some of you, it's going to make you mad this morning because this is not what you want to hear. All you want to know about church is, am I going to preach a good message, make you feel a little better about yourself, give, give you enough pump to where you want to come back next week? Maybe you'll do a little less dope next week. Maybe you'll drink a little less next week. Maybe you'll cuss a little less next week. Listen, that's not my job. And it's not yours. Your job is not to show up, be a number, and then say, you know what, I feel a little better about myself. I think I'll come next week. Your job eventually is to mature, grow, and become the gift that God intended you to be to the church. And until that happens, we're always going to struggle. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to, for the common good. Go to 1 Corinthians 14 and 12. This is the attitude that you should have. 1 Corinthians 14 and 12. Even so you, since you are, look at the person beside you and say, aren't you excited? 
Didn't this just get you up this morning, ready to go? I mean, I am zealous, fired up that I get to use my gift this morning. I mean, I am just ecstatic. Some of you are not. Because you started off wrong. You came with the wrong purpose. You came with the wrong agenda. And let me explain what will happen. Eventually, you will fall out of church. Let me just go ahead and save you the whole headway. You will fall out of church. Because it's like going to Walmart every day and never buying anything. If I said, I need you to go to Walmart, what you need? Nothing. I just want you to walk around it. Then come back home. And tomorrow, I ask you, hey, what, what can I do? I need you to go to Walmart. What you need? Nothing. Just go around, walk around, then go home. How long is it going to be before you eventually look at me and say, hey, what you need? I know. You need me to go to Walmart. Yeah, I need you to go to Walmart. You going to do it? No. Why? Because nothing ever happens. We don't buy anything. We don't get anything. If you'll do that at Walmart, then why do you think it's any different at church? I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm telling you that until we get to the point to where you understand what church is for, until you decide, I've got to make a move in my life. And making a move first means letting the Holy Spirit start having His way, filling, growing, maturing, producing the fruits of the Spirit, starting moving on my life. But the second move is that I have to understand I am the gift that this church, that God is wanting to give all seasons. I'm the gift. Well, I wish our church would grow. You'll be the catalyst. Man, I wish people would get saved. You'll be the catalyst. Even so, since you are zealous for... I know everybody's excited about it. Brother Lot, what I want more than anything else in life is to produce more spiritual gifts. I just can't wait. I'm excited. Teach me more. Show me more. Help me get better at my gifts. Isn't that what you say every Sunday? No, that's what I dream that you would say every Sunday. That's what I wake up every Sunday morning thinking, today there's going to be somebody that's just going to get it. It's going to snap. They're finally going to come and they're going to say, Bro, Lot, I'm all in. I'm all, and I'm like, yes. Because life will not change until this takes place. Let it be for edification of the church that you seek to so you have to be careful, even when you come to church and say, well, I, I want more gifts, I want more. Understand why you want them. It's only so that other people can become better. Why do I want to be a better preacher? So that I can help others become better. Why do I want to produce more uh, things and, and more classes? And, and, and why do I want all seasons to be the best it can be? So that it will produce better and he says, listen, be excited, zealous about spiritual gifts and all that's going on, but do it for the right reason. I got a great compliment yesterday at a table, and, and, and it was Karen's mom. And, and she gets it. She doesn't even come here all the time, but she got it. She was sitting there, and, and as we were eating, and, and she said, she said, well, well, how many do you have coming through these classes and stuff? And then she stopped just to say, she said, I know you don't care about numbers. And I was just like, thank you. I got people in my own church that don't get it. And here she is, I know you don't care about numbers, but how is it working? Because the numbers will eventually re reflect that you're working well. So on Wednesday night, when I say, well, I got 15 in PFCs, and I got 19 in women's, and I got 16 or 17 men doing their Bible study, and I got all these things going on, and then, yes, it does add up to be, quote, numbers, but what in overall, I'm thinking of, look at the ministry, look at the lives that are changing, look at the world that we're touching, and that becomes the catalyst for what I'm doing. I got 20-something in Blasting Point. I got 20-something in youth. I got, I got 15 or 16 college age. I, got, I, I could go on down the list. You're thinking, well, you don't, the numbers aren't there, but what the numbers tell me is, is that I'm touching lives. I'm touching that many lives. I'm, I'm ministering to that many people, and yes, I get zealous about 
spiritual gifts. I get zealous about my teaching. I get zealous about the preaching. I get zealous about them finding their place, using their gifts, finding their talents. Because I realize that's how the kingdom, that's how the church, that's how all seasons itself will ever grow. This just becomes the result. I get all the time people like, well, I wish I had that. That's, that's not it. It's the results are simply why you're doing it. And the church has lost that. And we look at numbers and we look at statistics and we look at all that to judge whether somebody's doing great. Paul didn't do that. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus could be preaching to thousands and then all of a sudden preach a sermon, thousands walk away. He was still Jesus. He was just doing what he was called to do. Go with me to Romans. One more verse before we jump into this. Romans 12, verses 3 through 8. Here's what it says. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all of the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. You get it? You are the gift. There is no other gift coming. If I say, God, I need, I need you to do more stuff. I need, you to, I need you to heal people in our church. I need you to heal people in our church. And I got sick people. I need you to heal people in our church. You know what God's going to do? He's going to send people who believe in prayer. He's not just going to all of a sudden miraculously just... He's going to send people that believe in prayer. And I'm going to start hearing about, you know, Brother Lot, I was praying for so-and-so and God just moved. And he, I'm thinking, awesome. If I, if I, if I need to, to finish stuff for camp and, and I'm like, okay, we, financially we got to, you know, we got to figure all this out. We got to balance all this. Then, then I begin to pray, God, only, you know what we need. You, 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 you've got all this. And all of a sudden somebody sends me a check through the mail. And, and how's God going to answer those needs? He's going to find somebody. And somebody's going to say, man, I heard what you're doing in a church down the road. And, and, and you know, we took up an offering and we wanted to give this to you. And, and if God wants to do anything through your life, you are the gift. We just get in a, we get in a routine of complaining about our church, our life, Pastor Lot, whatever it is. When we don't realize we're the change agent. Fall season's going to get better. It's going to be because you get better. Well, I wish people would come all the time. Then you got to come all the time. So all of us in here, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in the proportion of our faith. So if, if you're someone that... that has the gift of prophecy, seeing things, believing for things. Or ministry, if there's ministries to do, different ways to help the church do it. Let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in his teaching. If you're an exhorter, listen to what it says, verse 8. He who exhorts in exhortation. If you're smiling and, 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 and you have a great personality, then you ought to be getting up, putting that whitening stuff on your teeth, you don't, need, you don't need last week's cheeseburger hanging out between your teeth. Nobody needs, even though you may have it, you, you say, you say I, I feel like I'm a great, well, great, brush your teeth, smell good, take a bath, iron your clothes. Why? Because if you're going to do exhortation, in, or, in exhortation, he who exhorts, in exhortation, he who gives, 
If God's blessed you financially and, and you can give $100 and it won't put you behind, then do what? With liberality. Be happy. Be thankful God's blessed you that way. There's not one person who's more important than the other. There's not one person who can do more. You say, well, bro, I, you know, somebody who's given money, that's the most important. Not really. And, it, and to me, it's just one of the cogs in a wheel. Why? Because you can give all the money you want. I can carry to churches right now. They got a million dollars in the bank. Ain't got nobody to teach a Sunday school class. Guess what? There's nobody there. They got a big, beautiful building. All the bills are paid and nobody's there. You can't say one's important. What we do is we want to say one's more important. But listen, it's like a body. They're all part. He who leads, oh, we got leaders in the church? That's church bosses. No, he who leads with what? Diligence. Quit worrying about what everybody else thinks. Just lead and find out who's going to follow. He who shows mercy, do it with cheerfulness. Man, it's amazing all these things that are happening in a church are supposed to be happening in a church. You can't look at one and say, well, you know, they do this or they do. Yeah, but you have a part to play. Every one of you in this room has a part to play. So make a move. Be a gift. Be the gift. Look, let me ask you a question. What's the number one core value of all seasons? If you had to tell somebody and they said, what is, what is all seasons, what is its core value? I'll just go ahead and give it to you because it's not complicated. If you were to ask, it is the Bible is the authority for everything that we believe. People will ask, what denomination are you? Because they're not sure sometimes. People will ask, oh, 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 tell me about your background or where you got your license from. That, that. But it doesn't take very long to come to all seasons to find out, well, what are y'all about? Well, we're going to open this Bible, and we're going to stay right in it. I'm really not going to say much about the Clarion Ledger. I'm not going to talk about Fox News a whole bunch. I don't care what CNN came up with last night. I'm not going to preach the COVID all the time. I'm just going to preach what the Word, and let the Word cure and fix and that's our core value, that every, every week, Sunday or Wednesday when you come, we're going to open this Word and we're going to find out what God's Word says and how that affects our life. That's our core value. So if that's our core value, and if that's going to be our main thrust, then we have to do exactly what it says. So now go with me, because here again, I may make a few of you upset. I am already have. I can see the look on your face already. It's like, man, this is not making me feel better, Brother Lot. I'm trying. If you worked in the nursery some, you'd feel a lot better. If you helped in kids' church, passing out snacks, you'd feel a lot better. If you were praying for different people and operating in your gifts, let me tell you something, you'd feel a lot better. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 7. Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 7. A part of growing, ministering, is that the pastor has to get out of the way. Look at the person beside you and just tell them, say, I wish Pastor Lot would get out of the way. Say it real loud to each other so I can hear it. I wish Pastor Lot would get out of the way. Man, I've been waiting to hear that for years. I wish Pastor Lot would just get out of our way. Now, I know you don't really believe that, but maybe by the end I can help you believe it. Here's what it says. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's we understand what that is. I've read you other scriptures. Therefore, we say, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Do you understand? All of the Bible, the New Testament, is about what I'm preaching right here. We spend 90% of our time preaching, are you saved? Do you know the Lord? They did not spend 90% of the New Testament writing talking about, are you saved? 
They spent 90%. Are you operating in your gifts? Are you using your gifts? Are you growing in the relation? Are you being filled with the Spirit? Are you? That was their constant statements. That was constantly what they preached time and time, growing people. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, which means he descended, this is speaking of Jesus. When Jesus ascended after he had descended after death, he led captivity captive. In other words, now there is nothing that can hold or nothing that can bind that he can't release. There is no captivity other than the captivity that Christ has. So when you say, boy, Satan's got me bound, well, that would be contradictory to the Bible because Satan can't bind you. He used to could bind you, but since Jesus came, he took captivity captive, and now the only thing that you have to seek is what? And gave gifts unto... You say, I ain't worried about captivity. God, just... just Give my gift. My gifts will always get me out of any captivity. Oh, if I had time. Do you realize that the Old Testament, the Bible just basically says, the Old Testament is a shadow of what is the New Testament. So think about the stories in the Old Testament. Joseph. How did Joseph get out of captivity? Talk to me. How did Joseph get out of captivity? His gifts. He was a dreamer. His gifts got him out. How how did David come from being a shepherd boy to being the king? How, How did that happen? His gifts... Samuel said, God has chosen you, anointed him, and and he, he had gifts. Go down through the Bible. How did Daniel get out? The gift of prayer. How did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego escape? The gift of faith. See, what you don't realize is the answer to your problems, the answer to your issues is inside you. And there was a time when Satan could hold that and bind that. And it was only when God moved upon a few people to show a sign uh, that how God could do it. But since Jesus came and died and rose from the dead, there is no more captivity. So now, therefore, every one of us in this room can cry out, you know what, devil, you can't hold me. You can't bind me. You know what got Tim Lott from from Banks and Jones Street 28 years ago? You know what got me from there to here? My gifts. Oh, now don't worry, the devil's told me all the things I can't do. He's telling me all the things that I'm not good at. He's telling me all the things I'm sorry at, just like he does you. But you know what I kept doing? I kept leaning on my gifts. I'm just going to keep preaching my way out of this thing. I'm just going to keep praying my way out of this thing. I'm just going to keep dreaming my way out of this thing. And God, if you'll keep giving me gifts, I'll keep putting them into action. And as I keep putting them into action, then let it just be an astonishment to people how I got here. That's what David said. David said, God, I'm a mystery to people. I, 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 people can't understand me, an old shepherd boy that got to here. But David says, I understand how it is because I've never trusted in my troops and I've never trusted in those things around me and I've never trusted God the only thing I've ever trusted in is you. David said doesn't spend a lot of time talking about what God used to be or what God will be in the future but he says he is my shield. He is my fortress. He is my rock. David knew how to rest on his gifts. Mm. Okay. Now this he ascended What does it mean but that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth, speaking of his death and his resurrection? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might do what? Feel all things. Guess what a thing is? He said, I ascended so that I could feel all things. Not just nature. Not just the stuff that you see on the outside, but to feel all things. And he himself gave some to be what? Apostles, some prophets, 
some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. For the equipping of the saints for the work of, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children tossed and fro and carried away on by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into Him who is head, which is Christ, for whom the whole body joined and knitted together by what every joint supplies, according to the effectual workings by which every part does its share. Get it? Causes, bro, a lot. How you grow a church? Get the church you got working. That's the only way to grow a church. I, it, I know people write books all about it all the time. And if you want to buy a 120 page, 180 page, a 340 page book on how to grow a church, knock yourself out. But I can, I can do it in about five words. Save you all them other pages. You can just flip through them blank pages. Say, Pastor answered it in five words. Get your church working. Because this is what causes growth. Just like your body. You want your body to grow? You got to move. You got you to get active. Otherwise, it'll be unhealthy. Blood vessels will shrink. For whom the whole body joined and knit together by what? Every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share. Causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility, the futility of your mind. Having their understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness that is in their hearts. And it goes on. Who says that if you stay in this, you will move past feelings. You sit in church long enough unconnected, uncommitted, unactive. Let me tell you what will happen. You will lose feeling. Isn't that a bad thing when you sit on a chair or do something for a while and it's done cut off the circulation to part of your leg and then all of a sudden you try to stand up and you're like, oh my goodness. Why? Because you cut off circulation. It created deadness. And the only time it hurts is when you begin to try to do what? Move it. Guess what's going to happen? Let me just go ahead and break this to you. You know what's going to happen the moment you start doing what I say and you start getting active in church? Look at the person beside you and tell them, it's going to hurt. Bro, a lot, I got in church because I, you know, I won't feel good. And, I won't, and you will. But them first few months, weeks, years, it's going to hurt. And I wish I could spare you of that. But everything that I've ever grown into becoming has been because I was willing to go through the season of hurt. Yes, being here, you think, well, here is great, brother. Yes, but there also were years, Sheila, of hurt. When it wasn't easy, when it, when, 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 when it was a struggle every step of the way. But that's part of growth. So let's look at this morning. the important truths about this. Before we do, let me explain to you what those roles of what we just read, prophet, evangelist. Okay. The best way I can do this is to, as, as one writer does, sometimes I steal information. Is that okay? Y'all like stealing information? I do. Somebody does write something good, ain't no sense in me rewriting it. So I just steal it. I'm a professional thief but only good stuff. 
All right. So let's look at the gifts. And what I want to do is, um, okay. So you may know your gifts by how it affects you. So let's look at the gifts. Apostles. Now, what is an apostle and how does it work? All right. An apostle in Jesus' time was somebody who was a foundational part of the church. The Bible says is that Jesus is the chief cornerstone and uh, on him and with him in the foundation are the apostles. Okay, does that make sense? So all the original teachings, what you have in your Bible, all of that was written in the first 60 years after Jesus' death so that it could be a canon, it could be canonized so that it was truth. That's why when people come out with, uh, you know, the book of Judas, and they're like, why don't you put the book of Judas in there? It's, it's just a writing. No, it's not. It was written in 344 A.D. There was nobody to verify any of the things that they're saying. One of the scriptures makes it very clear when Paul is writing and writing these letters that are eventually canonized, he says in those letters, he says, listen, y'all well know that there are people with you and among you that can verify everything that I'm writing in this letter, what Jesus did. In other words, there are people that are alive with you right now that saw Jesus on the cross. There are people with you right now that can testify of the miracles that he did at Galilee because there are people that were there. That's why we don't want to come back 100, 200, 400 years later and say, oh, we found these writings in a cave. I don't care where you found them. I don't care if I sit down today and write some more stuff. It, it, there's nobody to verify it. Therefore, this is the canon. And what the apostles were, they were the people who canonized those teachings. So what is an apostle today, Brother Lot? An apostle today is someone who stands on the apostles. Remember, even if you go to certain denominations, you read every day the apostles' creed. Why? Because it's built in that our job as apostles of a church, we would title them more this time, this age, like this, elders, deacons. You ever heard those terms? They are the bedrock people of a church. Elders, deacons, and people of this nature, they are the people that are supposed to be the people that says, no, this is the truth that we're going to build this church on. This is the truth, and we're not moving from this. We're not, we're not adjusting from this. We're not, these are biblical things that we cannot move from. So let me show you what an apostle would get upset about. If you say, well, I may have, do I have any apostle in me? Well, let's see. Sometimes they want to take over the whole world and get frustrated at others because they don't understand the Lord is saying, go take it from the devil. So they're the people that get frustrated. Like when, when you say, man, we need to do this this ministry. And you got people like, well, I don't know. We don't need it. An apostle is going to be somebody who says, no, that's what we're called to do. We need to be doing it. I don't care what it takes. I don't care how much energy it takes. I, I, don't, I don't care what you have to do. You, do you have apostle in you? Or when somebody says, hey, we need to have a, a revival here at all seasons. Oh, brother, I, mean, I don't know if we can come Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Or whether you're the person that says, if that's what we need, let's do it. I'll be here every night, Brother Lot. Whatever we got to do, I'm here. I'm committed. Why? Because their whole thrust is we are to take this entire world from the devil. And their whole living is to accomplish that. An apostle is someone who is built. And, and what's hurting the church in this day and time is that we have very few apostles. We have, we have very few people who say, look, the most important thing that there is in the world is winning people to the Lord. Now, don't get me wrong. Most good pastors are apostles, right? And that's kind of why we promote them. Because, boy, I tell you, that Brother Lot, he, he wants to win the world. That Brother Lot, man, I'm telling you, he would, he, he'd give anything. That Brother Lot build anything, do anything. That Brother Lot, man, he, he, he's crazy. Okay? And so what normally happens is, you be the apostle, Brother Lot, and just drag us along. And if you have few apostles, it's hard to drag a lot of people, isn't it? I can carry you to good churches where the pastor is the apostle. He's got 50 or 100 people. That's about all he can handle. 
He's dragging them, trying to get them in church, trying to make them show up, trying to make them. If one of them gets up to sing, he's got to like, oh, Lord. Because they're going to get up and say, but I haven't sung in a long time. And I want y'all to be praying for me. I, I, my voice, it just ain't what it was. And just, just pray to God and get some glory. And I'm just like, I tell you, won't you just sit down? Just let, I'm going to save you and us. Just sit down. See, that's an apostle. Because his thought is, it ain't about you. The only thing that matters is, is how we're going to win the world. How we going, it, the only thing, an apostle, that's the way they think. Sometimes they'll seem like they're, they're mean. The apostle Paul, he was mean, wasn't he? He'd tell them, he said, look, you don't get that church straight. When I get there, I'll straighten it out, dead gummit. Oh, Pastor Paul, he just thinks he's somebody. Oh, I'll show you weakness when I get there. The apostle Paul said, I'd love to talk to you as adults, but I can't. You're like little babies, so I'm going to give you some milk. I mean, that's the apostle Paul. Why? Because his whole thrust was to win the world. Paul wanted to win the world. Maybe you're a prophet. Now, a prophet is someone who discerns, works in the spiritual gifts. He can sense, feel. Now, the best way to tell it this way, and that's the easiest illustration, is that a teacher is someone who, who gives you the Word of God through the Word. A prophet is someone who gives you the Word of God without a Word. Now, that seems strange, like, brother, like, that's kind of weird. No. When I say prophet, don't let someone walk up to you and say, you know, I just got a word from the Lord for you, and I just feel like, you know, you're supposed to do this, and you're supposed to marry this person over here, and you're supposed to have three children. No, don't do that. That's not what I'm talking about. Now, they may be someone that comes and confirms that. A prophet can be someone that walks up to you and says, Sweetie, I just feel like you're supposed to be back in school. And then you may start crying and say, No, oh, Lord, I've been feeling like that for two years. Felt like that. See, all I can do as a prophet is confirm what the Spirit is already speaking and already telling you. All I'm doing is I'm, I'm able to see beyond my life and I'm able to see into your life or into the world or into the church or into things around me. But it will never contradict what God's already speaking to you. If somebody come up to me today and said, Pastor, I feel like you and Elise are supposed to have two more children. <laughs> Cherry, I'll be looking at them like, devil is a liar. I know what spirit you got. If you don't believe me, go ask my wife. So a prophet can be someone who is... And here's the question that a prophet will always deal with. Sometimes a prophet will say, sometimes I get frustrated because everyone else can't see what is clearly right in front of them. If they would only look. Anybody got a little prophet in them? Yeah. There's times you're like, man, I have told my brother this and this a thousand times. If he just listened, man, I'm telling you, I can, I don't, why can't he see where he's going to end up? Well, that's a gift of prophecy. It's not that you can tell the future and you're reading palms. You're, it just means God through His Spirit is saying, can you see it? Yes. Well, tell them because I'm talking to them too. Because either two things will happen when you know God's talking to somebody about something. When you bring it up, they're either going to get really mad or they're going to cry. I, I found out that if, if, you just, if you just come up to them and say, Pastor, I feel like y'all are supposed to have two kids. I'm just going to give you like, huh? What? I'll be praying about that. Because it, it don't register with me. I'm just thinking, they lost their mind. But either two things are going to happen when somebody hits me, just like the last, the last thing was the camp or different things, well, before we started building the camp, and, 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 and I'm frustrated, and I'm, I'm like wrestling with this inside me, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh, God, I'm trying to fix this problem, and I'm trying every way. And somebody just looks at me one day and says, well, we just want us to build our own. And I'm like, oh, don't say that. Because it made me mad. Because the Holy Spirit then looks at me on the inside and says, duh. It's confirming what God's already dealing with me about. 
And a prophet inside a church is powerful because they can walk around and just hug your neck and just like, are you doing okay, sweetie? Yeah. You sure? I just feel like, feel like something's... And all of a sudden they start crying. I'm like, I knew it. Hey, I'm not trying to get in your business. I'm just telling you God is kind of laying it on my heart that something, something's not right. That's a prophet. That's a powerful gift inside the church. Just like an apostle who's, who's pushing and directing and saying, hey, we got to get there. The prophet is sitting there and they're constantly saying, hey, we got to make sure all the needs and everybody's pulling in the right direction. And, and the third is an evangelist. Now, Brother Lott, we know what evangelists are. They're people that we bring in. They, we hire them and try. No. I've always been of the opposite. Don't get me wrong. There are some evangelists who God calls to travel the country. Maybe, and, and, and God bless them. But that is not an evangelist. The role of an evangelist was meant to be operating in the church. Churches can't grow without evangelists. If you don't have evangelists, you can't grow. And here's what an evangelist would ask. Sometimes I think the whole church world is on the way to hell. Some in the church on, on their way to hell and get upset about that. Well, Lord, I just... I just Sometimes I think the whole world, the whole church world, I feel like everything is just, is just headed in the wrong direction and, 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 and we need a, a revival. We need to be revived to, to, get, to get upset about people's conditions. I got people in my church, man. I've had some through the years that, that go door to door, street to street and drive around and they can't stand the thought of people. If, if, what excites them the most is watching people getting baptized or watching someone getting saved or watching their life changed. The role of an evangelist is inside the church and what they are are they are the ones that are constantly have a burning hunger to see the world come to Jesus. See, if you have a church that has good teaching, good thing, but nobody cares about the lost, you're not going to grow. See how all these have to work together? An apostle has to be saying, guys, we got we to keep pushing forward. We got to keep believing. We got to keep growing. We got to keep... And then the prophet is sitting there intermingling in, among people and they're constantly making sure everybody, the sheep are not falling behind, that God is speaking to them and they're able to keep, to keep like so-and-so. I'll, I'll get a phone call. They, they'll say, Brother Lot, did you know about Brother so-and-so? No, I didn't, I, he didn't call me. I didn't know anything about it. That's okay. I just felt like something. I called him and I went to eat with him last week and man, we prayed and had a good thing. And, and I thought, that's awesome. Get out of the way, pastor. Get out of the way. But here's the thing. You have to, you have to push me out of the way. You have to say, pastor, get out of our way. Now, does that mean, bro, you ain't going to have nothing to do? No, no, I got a job. Because the next one is called a preacher and teacher. Guess what? That's what I do. Pastors. Sometimes a pastor will say it this way. I get the idea that all the people need is the gift of, of the pastor so they don't have other ministry gifts in their church. Pastors sometimes get the idea that all people need is the gift of the pastor so they don't have other ministry gifts in their church. Of all the things I have to teach young pastors and teach young preachers, this is it. Get out of the way. Well, I, I'm telling you what, I, I'm, I, want, so I want to get this new class started. Well, then pick somebody and let them teach it. I'm telling you, I ain't got nobody in my church that's qualified for that. Well, you're never going to have anybody in your church qualified because they're not you. Now, I'm going to say this, and I don't mean it ugly. I can teach every class in this church better than who's been teaching. Now, I'm not going to be as organized as, as some as Jennifer and them. Ain't no way. I don't have those skills. But my heart is for every, 
every ministry in this church extends from, it started from Pastor Lot years and years ago. So I understand that, yeah, I could go into PFCs and tell Kirkland, here, sit here and watch me teach PFCs. Hey, let me go to the youth class. I've done youth, man. I did youth for years. I can go teach youth. Man, let me work with it. I can do kids church, man. I can blow. In fact, I spent this week helping Kirkland, if you go to the gym, building and redoing his set for his new kids church stage and everything. Man, I was having a boss. He's like, he's like this is cool, Pastor Lot. I'm like, I have a lot of cool things. I can do a lot of cool things. I just can't do them all. So what do you do? You just don't have them. No. No. I realize that God will take the gifts of those people that are different than mine. And maybe they'll do it differently, but it'll be better. It'll just be different than the way I would do it. Most pastors can't think like that. Most pastors can't let it go. Listen. If you need somebody to pray for you, call me. If, if you have, need something, call me. If you're not sure, call me. It would drive some of them crazy on a Wednesday night to be standing here preaching to 50 or 60 people and knowing that there's about a 200 of them all over this campus in different classes and I ain't got the foggiest idea what they're talking about. I hope they're talking about Jesus. But I trust my leaders. I trust their hearts. I trust what God's gifted them to do. And so when somebody says, boy, your church is growing. No, my people are growing. And if my people grow, the church automatically grows. I remember Joel talking about his grandfather years ago over in in Morton, the church he pastored for years, great man. And, And watching him. But what he did was, what most people didn't realize was, he was constantly training. Joel, you do this. I don't know. Do it anyway. Why did he do that? He could have done it himself twice as good as Joel. But Joel couldn't have grown. It takes incredible, real pastors. And I'm not saying people aren't good pastors. I'm saying it takes incredible pastors to reach the point to where you realize my purpose in life is to grow the people in my church. And to teach it. Let's go back to Ephesians where we were just at. And let's reread that one more time. Pick up at verse 11 in Ephesians, verse 11. And to him... Himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Oh, bro, a lot. If we got all this going, the church is good. No. Notice what he said. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of. So, why is Jennifer and Stacy in Blasting Point? So that they can equip 10. 11, 12-year-old kids to be better Christians than they've been. Their job is a success when they have accomplished that goal. This, this weekend, we had our, about 29 of our college-age teenagers went to uh, Winterfest. And they were excited. They, they texted Elise last night. In fact, I eventually called her and was talking to her on the phone. I'm like, who in the world is calling this time in the morning? They were all excited. Several of them had, 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 had been refilled. Four of them received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Fresh and new. Man, I'm telling you, they were, they were fired up. So, You know, I should have been on that trip. Sherry, if I'd have been on that trip, it would have gone a little bit better probably. No. The greatest thing I could do is allow my equippers to equip and watch God do something that, Pastor, if you'll just get out of the way, let us do what we're called to do. Now, does that mean I don't have a role? No. If you get out of line, I will yank a knot in you. That's my job. But I don't need to be worried about all the knots. If we work this way, 
for the equipping of the saints, for the working of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come into the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning and craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth that we may grow up in all things to Him who is the head who is Christ, for whom the whole body is joined and knitted together by what every joint supplies. Now that, what every joint supplies there, it uses the word ligament. Your Bible may say ligament. Let me show it to you this way. When I was young, I was, I was one of the f- fastest people in this state. I could run. I loved sports. I loved... And, and, and you would think, well, brother, I can't nothing stop that. And God showed me in one basketball game while I was doing something I've done a thousand times, make a layup, I landed awkwardly and I heard something old. What I used to do so naturally, now I could not even halfway do it anymore. Two ligaments torn. And I could be playing tennis and, and turn and hit a tennis ball and my knee would lock and I'd just fall. And I'd have to lay on the ground and push my leg sideways and pop it back in place. It would swell up for a few days and I'd think, oh. All because of two ligaments. Not muscles. Not, 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 not anything. You, you couldn't tell anything by looking at me. Two little ligaments. But those two little ligaments held my knee in place. And it held it secure. From whom the whole body joined and knitted together what every joint according to the affecting working by which every part does its causes Now, if you you look at my my legs, this one is like half the size of the other one. And I work it, I try. It doesn't do any good. This leg just won't do what the other leg will do. Because of two ligaments. I know when we think of it, I'm the nose, or what's my big finger, or somebody. Let me tell you something. Jesus broke it down. The Apostle Paul broke it down to where even a blood vessel. And I'll say this in close. I watched this firsthand with Brian Chisholm. Brian, when he came to our church, eventually had to come on and, and just work because he was unemployed. He couldn't, couldn't work anywhere else. Let me tell you why. Because he had, he had surgery on his leg. He had surgery on his leg, and when he did, unknowing to anybody, they had pinched one blood vessel, one area, and it had caused deadness in his foot. He had to wear a brace on his foot for years. And for years, he would sit here, and we'd have that brace, and he couldn't do anything, and and, and we started praying, and miraculously, God eventually healed his foot. But we would sit there many a time and look and and just think, just because the doctor just pinched off one blood vessel, the doctor or whatever had had just done one little thing, one one thing. It wasn't like he cut his muscle. It wasn't like he did. He just one thing. I'm going to tell you what the enemy does to you every single day. He says, you don't matter. You're a little thing at all seasons. You're just a little thing. Nobody would even care if you were here. Let me tell you the real truth. 
You are the gift that God gave to all seasons. You are the gift God gave all seasons. And all seasons or the work that God has for this place and this community will never be full until you, until you do everything that God called you to do. Now you can go home today and shake that off and you go home today and say, oh, you didn't mean, I just read you all these scriptures. I just... Before the devil blinds you and confuses you and makes you think you're useless again, God sent me by to tell you that you are the gift that God sent to this church. And this church will never be all it's supposed to be until everybody is using their gifts to touch every life they can. Will you stand? Make a move. Every one of us has to make a move. And I'm thankful to so many who have. I'm thankful because of the classes that we have and the people we have working in all those ministries and youth and kids' church. And man, we are, we are so blessed because of so many people who made moves. People like Kirkland who, who was working in a doctor's office and had a job and had everything and He's like, Pastor, I, I just want to be more up there and I want to do more stuff and I want, I want to be involved. And as, as the thousand sacrifices that people make. But life doesn't change until you decide to make a move. We're fixing to do different things of, of new classes that will be starting. And, 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 but we need people to make a move. Step outside what's comfortable and normal. Step into the place God called you to be. And what's going to happen, Brother Lot? Well, all seasons, the, the work that God calls to do will all be strong. In other words, I'll have enough people work in the nursery because everybody says, hey, one Sunday morning, either first or second service, I'll volunteer to work nursery. I can sit in there for an hour with those little ones while somebody else can can come to church. My daughter, if you want to know, just, just give you an idea, my, this is my third, third straight week in a row, my daughter's working in nursery because they don't have enough volunteers. My daughter today, she will leave today, go home, get something to eat, and then she will go sit at a computer. And she'll watch my sermon on computer because she couldn't be in here. Now, she doesn't want to not be in there all the time. But she sure loved to tag out with people from time to time. See, when everybody is pulled together, then everybody, the body grows. And all that all seasons and God needs is for just somebody to say, I'll make a move. But a lot, of, it's time for me to make a move. As one guy said, not to be a spectator, but a participator. And I promise you, this is my job. I'm going to get out of your way. I'm going to help you get there. I'm not going to sit here and do it for you. I'm going to help you get to that place. Because that's what I was called to do. And when we all do our part, what we've seen so far is only scratching the surface of what God wants to do. We have so many new people coming every single week. Every, it's incredible how many people we see. But if we don't have the ministries and we don't have the volunteers, we don't have people loving on them and people greeting them and people prophesying over them and people praying for them and people, then we're liable to lose all of them. I don't want to do that. I want to see how far the body can grow. I always wonder how, how far can God grow this body. 
We're the gift. Before I pray for you, turn to that person one more time and just look at them in the eye and say, you're the gift God gave us. And we really need you. Father, I'm thankful for all that we do and all that we continue to do. And God, I'm not preaching something sad this morning because of all the people right now that all through this building are, are loving on people and greeting people and they're stepping into their roles. But God, I can't help but sometimes wonder and imagine what it would be like if there were more that said, I want to be part of that too. I can't dream with you, God. But I can dream a little bit. And I can see just from that how you said that if the body is healthy and it's supplying and strengthening each other, that God, it naturally grows. God, this year I feel like that's what we're called to do. To be filled to be filled with our roles, to be filled with our calling, to be filled with your spirit, to be filled and allowing him to get glory. And then watching that, watching that touch lives. God, for that person that I'm talking to today that is losing feeling, I come to church, I just, it's just church. God, let them see that it's not the building that's a problem. Let them see that it's not just the preaching that's the problem or the singing. Lord, let them see that the problem is inside of them is a gift. And that true joy and happiness will never be found until they release their gifts. God, that's where true joy is found. And I hope that you'll show that to them. If they don't know it, let them find me. Let them, let them start on a journey with me. Pastor, help me find my gift. Help me find what I love doing. Help me find what God's called me to do. Father, don't let them sit there and grow more frustrated every day. Father, let them find everything you've had for them and every gift that you put in them. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. Hey, go give that old devil fits. <laughs>